Thanks for downloading the Marcus Pi podcast. Welcome to the Marcus Pi podcast on historicracingnews.com. It's been a busy week for historic motorsport. We've had the Vintage Sports Car Club Pomeroy Trophy event at Silverstone kicking off their season. And uh, we're looking forward, of course, to Race Retro, which kicks off uh, at Stonely near Kenilworth on Friday. Uh, before that, though, uh, we're going to uh, speak to Nick Whale of uh, Silverstone Auctions about his uh, great sale uh, at the Race Retro event, which is a, an annual uh, pilgrimage these days for motorsport fans in the UK. Uh, but first of all, uh, we've got Martin Warner from uh, Sheer Hill Climb with us. Welcome. And uh, tell us a little bit about the Sheer Hill Climb. It's not <coughs> one that I've been to, but it's certainly uh, on the radar increasingly. Um, uh, it's event. It's grown very well over the last eight years. It's our eighth year coming up now in September the 6th. Um, yeah, we started 12 years ago. Uh, sorry, eight years ago in 2012. Um, we've been trying to find somewhere in the Surrey Hills to run an event for quite some time and uh, not getting very far. As you can imagine in Surrey, you know, we're all used to going to the Midlands and we, we looked around uh, the site we have, we looked at it and sort of moved on quite quickly um, because it didn't seem spectacular enough. Um, what is now our off-road down the other side of the, of the downs is the road we wanted to use, but... It was very windy. There was no room for a paddock. The trees were very close to the road, all sorts of issues with it. <clears throat> and we were getting nowhere with uh, both Surrey and Guildford Council. They didn't want to know. Um, no way we could close a road in Surrey. Um, then, of course, um, the 2012 Olympics came along and they closed the road for the cyclists. They did indeed. Box Hill, I remember, in Dorking. Was yeah, it? and all th that was all part of the route. But our, our road uh, that we wanted to use, Staples Lane, um, was on their route. So they summarily closed it. So the arguments they've been using with us just evaporated. Oh, precedent is everything. Yes. Um, and they also know how you know we all love the cyclists on a Sunday, you know, um, blocking our driving. So... Um, um, they finally had to relent. Um, they were shocked, horrified, health and safety went bananas, but bit by bit we've dealt with all their issues and turned it into, I think, quite an efficient but still relaxed and, and fun event. Paint, paint a picture for us. Um, you, you talk about the sheer hill climb. Where exactly is sheer? It's... Um, the, on the Shear of the Village is on the A25, which runs between Guildford and Dorking along the bottom of the Downs. Um, it's called the Shear Hill Climb, but actually we're over the hill, um, just outside the village of um, Clandon, East Clandon. Um, but the site, when you finish the hill, when you go down the other side, you come down to Shear Village before you come over Newlands Corner and back round into the paddock. So. And it's an area uh, steeped in motorsport history, really, because um, Chris Williams was a racer from uh, that area. Um, you've got um, Peter Westbury uh, oh, yes, from Felday. I, I knew Peter, yes. Felday Engineering. Yes. Um, he was British Hill Climb Championship uh, winner in 1963 and 64. With yeah. the Felday car Patsy and the, and the, the Ferguson. Absolutely right. And B &B motors, yeah. Rob Walker really close by, all those things. So it's a real den of, uh, uh, of motorsport of the past. Oh, yes, and West Surrey Racing down in... Um, um, yeah, they're not um, far away. Yeah, down near the Parrot, yes. But, uh, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of us around there. Well, as soon as we started having the event, um, these cars started appearing out of nowhere. Could I please enter? I, I mean, we were amazed what people have got down there. So. And it's a, it's a non-competitive event, isn't it? Not against the clock. Yeah, I mean, it was, as I said, we had trouble getting the road closed in the first place. So it was softly, softly. And it was always our intention to just get it going as a friendly um parade of cars in inverted commas um but we thought we would move over time to an msa event that was the plan but actually we found we'd hit upon a really nice formula for the event uh where people who uh, do compete uh can come along and have a relaxed day and people who would never compete can bring along their um nice uh, car and play at being Ed and Senna for the day. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, so really it's a, um, a deeply social uh, day out for uh, people who want to go enjoy the, um, the Surrey countryside uh, who 
probably like cars, and if they do like cars, it's a massive bonus. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've always been aware of the old original format of hill climbs. It was when, you know, everyone was at Brooklands all day, uh, you know, working hard and uh, on a concrete... Uh, in, in a concrete environment and getting their car around the track and hopefully surviving, that they started having hill climbs on one's front drive of one's stately mansion. Sometimes called speed trials, speed I seem trials, to remember. Where you could, yes, you could all go off and have a nice garden party and then pop in the car and run up the hill and then come back and join the women in the champagne tent. And uh, I've always been aware of that. That's how it used to be. Um, but even, even hill climbs in lovely places now have to be... Uh, because of MSA um, necessary rules, have to be a bit more careful about things. So I wanted to sort of try and recreate that friendly, happy atmosphere where you can blast up the hill and then come back and chat with your friends. I'm when I do the drivers' briefing first thing in the morning, and one of the things I enjoy about it is I make it quite serious because again, it's part of making people re well. They need to be responsible anyway, but also make them think they're doing something, you know, a proper event. Absolutely. Um, but I do emphasise that. Uh, when the car's in the paddock, have the bonnet open. And, um, and if people are looking at your car, they'll never talk to you. So make sure you talk to them. And, and if the kids aren't holding ice creams, let them sit in your car because the way the value of cars are going, you know. Um, Might be the closest kids, they ever get. Exactly, exactly. But so how do you get them all um, interested and enthused? enthused by the subject yeah. well you know if they go home and say oh, i've sat in a bugatti or i've sat in a lamborghini that's a real wow factor from it's some of the things that you know we take for granted i think it's so important i think engaging future generations in a um, in a world that is increasingly difficult to get involved with uh, what is effectively high cost uh, leisure uh, activities um, is so so important and um, it's hill climbing is a very very good way of doing it because you can get so up close and personal with the cars and the personalities and I remember going as a kid to Great Auckland that I'll touch on uh, later in this podcast and um, thinking it was just the greatest show on earth just fantastic yeah yeah I mean it's I mean it, it just struck me having been to many events over the years and competed and enjoyed them that you you kind of forget what a spectacle they can be and how many people have never been to those kinds of events. And suddenly there we are in, in Surrey, uh, giving them the opportunity. And whether that makes them think, I'll go and visit Prescott and, or Chelsea Walsh as well, I don't know. Um, you, say, you say you competed. Is that how you first became involved or did you go as a spectator uh, first? Well, we all went as spectators, didn't we? Uh, um, <coughs> yes, I remember when I was about 12 years old at Silverstone with the Aston Martin Owners Club, being a, being a runner from the from the timing in the pits round to that old um, corrugated iron uh, tower on the outside of Woodcote, taking messages round and things like that. So I, I was involved. I was involved at that age, and of course, um, when I met when I came of uh, driving age, I bought myself an MGA Twin Cam, which I've still got. Like one does. Yeah, and that keeps you busy constantly, keeping it going. Um, still drive it now. My daughters drive it now, but. But over the years, I've had lots of cars. Um, I used to have a, uh, a K-Type Magnet MG, which I used to race at Silverstone and hill climb all over the place. I um, had a 3098 Vauxhall for some years, which I used to trial. That is the best thing in the world. Just four people in a car together, trialling, you just laugh all day. You, know, you see two people in an Austin 7 as miserable as sin at the end, they're not talking to each other. But I'd never do it with two people. We have four of you in a 20s... <laughs> Four and a half litre open tourer, for, for, and the shouting and the banter and thing is just hysterical. As someone who likes, I almost ashamed to admit, a sort of a modern, comfortable, warm car. It sounds like purgatory. <laughs> oh no, Ex Exmoor in February in the snow. Um, mm. You know, it's the old thing about the right clothes, isn't it? But um, yeah, exactly. It's just just a delight. I used to. Um, We'd stay with the three of us would go down. We'd stay on a friend's farm down there. And I would deliberately come out in the... Well, my friend would muck out the pigs and then get straight in the back of the car, still with the overalls done up to here, smelling of pigs. Um, and I would deliberately have a very shiny, polished pair of shoes, which I would get into the driver's seat with. And I would say to them all, I said, see those shoes? They're clean. If they're dirty at the end of the day, you three have not done your job. And that, to the point where I used to sometimes, when we were struggling, try and get out to him, no, no, you stay where you are. We're not going to allow you. So it was, a, it was a good ruse, actually, for me not to have to get involved. <laughs> I, can, I can sense where all the enthusiasm is coming yeah. from, Martin. But uh, returning to, to hill climbing, 
um, and, and Sheer in particular. Uh, what kind of cars and how many cars do you have uh, on site during the day? Well, the entries, are, it's always been an embarrassment of numbers um, right from the start. Um, we start first year, we did about 120 cars to see how we go, and we were finished soon after lunch, so we've learnt. And over the years, we've crept it up every year to <clears throat> just over 200 we're, we're running now. But um, Is I mean, that about the ceiling, would you say? Practically. Yeah, we're getting close to it. Could have parked them somewhere, haven't you? Well, we, uh, the space for parking we've got. It, it's literally uh, the numbers of how many seconds between a car going up the hill and how long that takes through a day. And and please God, nobody breaks down or has to be towed off because that obviously, you know, we have to allow that little bit of margin. Um, and the earliest sort of cars you'd have uh, in this, typically? Well, Brooklyn's always attend quite strongly. And last year they had a 1903 Peugeot motorbike. Okay. No clutch or anything, just push it and jump on and go. Um, right jump up. on and fall off if it was me. <laughs> right up to the latest McLaren, um, which... Um, we were uh, very surprised, but McLaren, McLaren lent us a car last year. They were, it was coming with a driver, but the driver could make it, so they said, can you come and pick it up? So we did. Um, Desperately disappointing. I know, I know. So, uh, um, so, and anything in between. I pride myself on having a very eclectic taste in cars. Uh, and so we'll have anything from a very ordinary-looking Farina, ballsy, um, you know, to the latest McLaren, Back to uh, the usual range of sports cars. Um, we have a 1900-something Berlier with a Curtis aeroplane in engine run by John Dennis. Um, Fantastic. You know, and we, we will have... There's a guy letting every year with a Fiat Uno with a tuned engine, but he's a, he's a lovely lad, and he's been with us um, all the time. He's got a, he runs a tyre-fitting business in Bookham and always puts out posts and things like that, and he's in it every year in this little Fiat Uno. So what I'm trying to say is a really wide mix of cars um is what i want to see and so it sounds like it's sort of totally non-denominational which is brilliant so it's something for everybody yeah yeah exactly there will be something for everybody there will be uh, and I, I think some people are persuaded about cars that they didn't like before but when they're there you know we have a we have the the rusty hot rods which seem to be the uh, the vogue at the moment yeah uh, well they call them rat rods don't they like yeah, that, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, it used to be local but now i mean we we had them from uh, Shropshire, Lincolnshire. We had one from Aberdeen. Must be mad coming down there. <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah, Plymouth, and and we last year we came an international event because we had two entrants from France last year. Just uh, incredible. That's that's brilliant, isn't it? And this year I've had an email from them. There was ten of them want to come, um, and with weird and wonderful cars, some of which I've never seen the like of before. So there'll be a cheese and wine party afterwards in the paddock. <laughs> During, during. Oh, during, okay. During, during. <laughs> but uh, no, brilliant. So the idea is that um, what everyone rocks up, what, on uh, the night before or whatever and parks up or what? No, no. Um, yeah, gates open, oh, God, about six o'clock in the morning. And we've already been there for two or three days. Oh, the right? joys of the event promoter. <laughs> the people have to behave at that time in the morning, otherwise we won't. <laughs> We're on a fairly short few well, um, hope you <laughs> Just hope your shoes are clean. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so you, you, you pitch up and then you, you marshal them into... Yeah, we marshal uh, them into their paddock places, yes. you know, and, um, you know, there's... Um, you know, we, we read them the rules and things at uh, half past eight and first car goes up at nine. And is it a kind of a, a set order for the cars or is it fairly random or you try to run them from... Absolute set order. You know, yeah. You, you take your number and you... And you Follow the one before you, as it were. Oh, okay. So uh, there's a, you get three runs. Is there a program runs. list so um, oh, yeah, people absolutely. can follow? We're quite professional. Yeah, it's a proper program and yep. tells you the names of the car. But, I mean, we weren't professional in the early days, but we are now. It's all uh, good value for money, which you, you have to be proper grandstands now. That's where most of my money goes. But then you um, you, you put profits into um, charitable organisations? Well, yeah, yeah. Um, as I said on the film, we did with Paul. We didn't start as, uh, with the idea of making money for charity, but you know, first year was um, very half arse the way we did it, but um, we made £8,000, so we gave it to local charities. And uh, and since then, that's grown to regularly about 20000 or more. Um, and um, we know our bread's buttered, so, um, and we know a lot of people love us, but there are still people who are not sure about us, so we make sure the money stays very, very locally. And, uh, and you know, we're restoring the, we were 
they were restoring. We give money to the restoration of the, there's a Saxon church in Albury Park, which is always in films and what have you, because it's very, oh, it's got a dome on it. Um, you know, it's got three numbers on the wall in there. So uh, um, so we, uh, we give them a, a fair amount of money and we give the local villages money and, uh, and there's obviously disabled um, uh, schools and things around riding for the disabled. There's cherry trees, literally across the road from there's cherry trees where there's a lot of disabled children in there. So that's an obvious one that we give money to. That's absolutely brilliant. And I'm sure that, uh, that they're very grateful for that do they come along in number to support you and uh... they do uh, where they where they can we yeah. we can't insist but we're no. quite firm about we want you there you know have a small stand to promote your your charity you know um you know to, to, you want people to understand you know what it's about so uh give us a bit of protection if the police take interest in us again <laughs> <laughs> how um, how long is the course at 1.1 miles demanding or fairly gentle it's um it's Interesting, you know, there's a there's a there's a first straight with a nice hump in the middle of it. I mean, I take it flat in the twin cam, but you watch anyone in a in a McLaren, you watch them break as they go over that. You think, ha, ah, yeah. So, <laughs> so there's a natural um, speed bump there. Then there's a then it suddenly turns steeper with a very sharp left followed by a very sharp a very sharp right followed by a very sharp left. And then a, a long drive over the finish line. We put various chicanes in the place, in in, in place up the track. Um, some are. Um, well, I obviously wasn't sure about chicanes to start with, but actually they make it a much more interesting course. Yeah. And it does give us control. And do you have a the car. do you have a return road or do they come back down? The, well, that's the main... it. They go. So they carry straight on down this windy hill through the woods down to Shear, which was the road we first thought we'd have. And then they come to the A25, and then there's a beautiful drive up over the downs over Newlands Corner, which is quite a famous spot where the views are fantastic, and you come back round and down again into the um, in, in, into the paddock. So that makes it a lot more um, pragmatic, a lot more practical to, to actually run, having that uh, circular route, if you like, doesn't it? Yes, it's not like Wiscombe Park where everybody gathered at the top of the hill and you sat there for an hour and then when you could be back in the bar you have to sit up there waiting for your opportunity to go back down again so now you're straight back round and back amongst your friends excellent uh, and the entries are, are, are rattling in at this point or are you full or are we you... open for entries on the first of march yep and we're open for two months to the end of april right and we normally get a lot on the first day um and then they drift in over a couple of months and then i hold a few pace places for cars that I'm keen to have, you know, um, that turn up later in the day. Um, but, at the, but at the end, we're always uh, squeezing them in at the end. Basically. But that's fantastic. I mean, if people are actually queuing up to, to, to be part of the next event pretty much from when the previous one's finished, that uh, tells you that what you're doing is, um, is, is right. Well, I, I, it's nice of you to say that. And, you know, not being clever, but I think we are doing it right, but we didn't know we were going to be doing it right. We just, we've hit on something that just works for people it just captures their imagination really because i suppose it's 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 different different because it's kind of out of context for the area isn't it and that uh, i think is quite important well that that's very that's very true there's there's nothing like that around us um it, it's we we're trying to keep a lid on it a bit i mean uh i've been to cop a couple of times the guys at cop have been really helpful to us <clears throat> They're far enough away not to be competitive with us, but they're close enough to help out. And especially when they tried to close us down, the guys were, caught, were down there in the meetings with us and fighting our corner for us. Which was, when, when you say they tried to close you down, who's, who's oh, the police? Oh, the police and the council tried to close us down. But uh, right. Barry Marsh, especially from Cop, he came down. And, I mean, he was virtually taking the policeman outside to have a fight. I mean, he was really on his case. This is rather, <laughs> this is rather like the um, when, when Castle Coombe was trying to win permanent planning permission for its race circuit, which had been there since 1950. Yeah. and um, it got into the 1970s and um, <clears throat> basically James Hunt came along uh, sat in the in the courtroom with the, with the judge or the magistrate or whoever it was and uh, basically um, uh, schmoozed them and charmed them and uh, was I think very instrumental in uh, uh, in it all going through and going the way that motorsport fans wanted yeah, well, I mean, we would have to go to this meeting, the SAG meeting at Guildford Council's Safety Action Group. Um, I thought that was it, Indian for spinach. Yeah, yes. SAG problem, please. <coughs> Never thought about that. But, they, but there'd be a room full of people. Um, some you wouldn't know who they were. Some, I mean, to be fair, I mean, they, they, they did put us on the straight and narrow and gave us good advice and, and got us sorted out. But, um, but 
the guy, the chairman of the SAG committee said to Barry Marshall Coffey, he said, so, you know, how many SAG meetings do you go to each year for your event? Bearing in mind they've been going for 10 years or more. He said, never been to one. Never been to one, don't know what they're about. He said, but the people from, um, um, I think it's Prince's Risborough Council, he said, they come to the event, thoroughly enjoy the day, and if they see something that they slightly doubt about, they tell us about it, and we deal with it. So they, they have a much more proactive way of doing things. So a self-policing kind of thing, really. I had to force the, the police and the council to come to the event. I mean, the policeman who was at this first meeting who was taking us on, um, I realised while he was talking, not only did he never been to the event, he didn't even know where it was. He'd watched it on YouTube, seen a car spin its wheels, and said that's um, dangerous driving, close the event. I remember going to um, to Kerbera, to the, the, the sprint course near Litchfield once, my first time there, and it was not a, um, a, a proper event, it was just a closed um, practice day, and um, I couldn't find the place. Oh, and eventually I had the bright idea of flagging down a police car, I stopped this panda car and sort of waved at the gentleman. And he sort of said, uh, um, you know, what's it all about there? What, what, what's your problem? I said, I'm trying to find Kerbera, the sprint course, where they have a bit of car racing locally. And he said, uh, absolutely no idea where it is. <laughs> so I said, fine. At which point I heard an engine in the background sort of fire up and I kind of followed my ears to where it was. <laughs> I mentioned it to the person on the gate and he said, oh, he said, uh, I said, please couldn't help you. He said, that's the way we like to keep it, sir. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, they're a lot better now, but they've, um, I don't think they'd admit it, but they, I think the council, certainly the council, I think quite like us now. And I, and I, I mean, to be fair to them, we did need putting on the straight and narrow. Uh, yeah. over it. But um, just over running an event, not particularly a motor event. Exactly. Event, but you built it into a really popular local attraction. Yes. You get um, a good footfall in terms of um, uh, people coming along. We had about 3,000 people on site last year, which was fantastic. Still reckon I can get another 1,000 in. Um, and um, you know, then we'll start selling tickets online only, which would be great. But uh, each year, I try and build more grandstands and have more facilities, and which of course takes um, takes resource. Well, it does. But um, I, each year, I always think, well, well, we'll have less. You know, I'm spending this. We'll have less money to give to charity. But at the end, it's helped to increase the numbers. So the money for charity seems to sort of stay the same, even though I've invested some. It it, it makes. You know, money by just improving it each year. When um, when actually is it this year? September, you say? September? It's September the sixth. It's always the first uh, Sunday in uh, September. Last year was the first. This year it's the sixth. So it probably makes it the day after the Brighton Speed Trials then. It does. We have the same marshals. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's all very <laughs> they, helpful because they finish the Brighton Speed Trial and then come up to us. They're they're out and about, yes, uh, yeah. and then probably warming themselves up. Some of them for um, going to Goodwood for the following weekend for the uh, for the revival. That's right. That's right. We. Um, um, I don't know what I'd want from Goodwood, but I tried to um, wave my hand in there and say, look, we're over here, we're over here, in the hope they would uh, see us as a, a pre-event, a warm-up event for them. But uh, they don't take any notice of us. But, then, but maybe that's a good thing. They're probably using you as the warm-up event for, for Goodwood, right? well, certainly for the Marshalls anyway. <laughs> but So um, specials this year, um, anything uh, you're introducing or... Uh, you're expecting to turn up. I know it's a bit early in terms of entries, but I guess you've been targeting one or two things. Um, we're obviously with McLaren just down the road in Woking. We tried for years to get at them, never answer my emails or anything like that. And then last year, one of the guys in the committee, a friend of a friend, knew someone there, and suddenly they switched and they were great. As I've already said, they gave us a car, and late in the day, Kenny Brack turned up. Excellent. And Unfortunately, we didn't know he was coming, uh, so we didn't. Pretty didn't bake him a cake or anything. I'm not sure whether the head commentator got the gist and told everybody about it. You did, I wasn't this. Um, and it was great to have him. I mean, yeah, you got a an Indy 500 winner and a Le Mans winner, and he turns up at a little old sheer hill climb and showed us how this McLaren should be driven. Excellent. Um, and that was great to have him. But uh, um, we'd have liked to have promoted him more. But I suppose even he didn't know he was coming. But this year, I mean, McLaren have got other things to think about, obviously, especially at the moment with testing and whatever going on. But um, we're hoping they can formalise it a bit more this year so we can get more out of them. I'm hoping for a dummy F1 car at least. I mean, not on the hill, but I'm hoping for a dummy one. Sure, know. sure. I mean, last year, Brooklyn's brought the Napier Rail to the lawn, which was Wow, that is fabulous. world class. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not the... It's not road registered and the cars, even though the road is closed, they have to be road legal. So, But they fired it up in the paddock. It was fantastic. As as um, Paul announced they were about to fire it up, 
the whole grandstand just cleared of people and just shot over to where Brooklyn's had their display. And they fired this thing up and you know, no one could believe it. And this thing, you know, you, you and I, it's difficult. You and I know these cars and, and know about them, but you have people there who've never seen a vehicle like that. And then see it fired up and they, do, and they drove it around in the paddock. Um, this is why um, commentary at these sort of events is so important because it is so necessary to engage people, to educate people, to inform them. And yes. it's it's different from the people who go to a regular race meeting where they all want to know about gear ratios and um, uh, and spring rates and things like that, which actually are only interesting if you are absolutely fanatical about your uh, your racing or whatever. Yes, yes, I think we... we... I, I've never uh, sort of done a proper survey, but I would guess that we have 50% petrol heads who are really interested in the details of the car, and 50%, the other 50% are locally people who probably never go to another car event, um, but come to this and are being drawn into the interest. I mean, I have friends of mine who I know had no interest in motor cars, and they tell me afterwards, and it was just amazing, fantastic. I didn't know this car existed. I didn't know that car existed. It's um, fantastic. And you're looking at them and thinking, well, of course they've existed. I've known about them forever, but we live in our own little bubble. E don't we? Exactly. And they're different things also. Similar kind of um, <coughs> deal with the Capel car show, which yes. tends to run every summer. Yeah. Uh, there's and there's a little there. um, little kind of hotbed of, uh, of racing activity around there. And uh, it, it's all so exciting because, um, again, it's that mix of people who look incredulously. Um, at a Formula 5000 car sitting in a field in Surrey. Yeah. Um, I think it's absolutely marvellous. And uh, it, it sounds like an event for all the family, which is, uh, again, uh, inclusive, uh, important, great to use your le leisure time uh, in a quality way. Um, I, I'm guessing you have um, quite a lot of... Um, little stands in there where you can get uh, some, some nice uh, oh, yeah. uh, we libation. Have a, we have a um, poor chap, Paul Wildash, who's in charge of catering on the committee, so he gets beaten up every year for not getting it right. But uh, but it gets better every year, and yeah, we have some very good food there now. All local stuff. Bit of, bit of craft brewery going on. Oh, well, the local brewery, we closed down because they're on our course, oh. so they uh, have to be on site selling their beer. <laughs> it's the least we can do. Plus, there's a gin distiller in the village, so a silent pool gin, so... They're on our course as well, so they're there. So uh, we're not sh we're not short of, uh, of all that uh, that sort of thing. Well, what, what's what's not to like? Um, Martin Warner from Sheer Hill Climb. Uh, just give us once more the, the date of the event, so people can write it in their diaries. It's the first Sunday in September, the sixth. Um, it's uh, although we call it Sheer Hill Climb, it's actually East Clandon is the. Uh, exact address but you know if you're coming on the day you want have trouble finding it tickets tap it, in, will tap become, it into your sat navs now yeah uh, tickets will become available online in the next month or so but you can also pay on the day at the mo at the moment until we get too busy to, do, to allow you to do that but brilliant stuff it sounds like you've hit upon an absolute uh, gem well the, uh, and um, built it into something very as, special as things go um i'm sorry i know you want to wind up but as um Things go forward. We read in the press all the time about the future of cars and, and how we're going to get closed down and have to go around in electric pods. There's a lot of classic cars out there that will be needing things to do. And Sheer Hill Climb is definitely one of those. Things. Plus, as I say, people who are not particular followers of classic cars are becoming followers of classic cars by coming to our event. And they will need to support um, you know, even if they don't own them, they will need to support the idea of owning classic cars uh, and, and make sure they can still see them every year. And, and events like ours, um, I, I think, are at the forefront of that. All power to you. Uh, fantastic stuff. That's, uh, that's Martin Warner then from Sheer Hill Climb. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs>
Well, I've caught up with Nick Whale, principal of Silverstone Auctions, and uh, for the ninth year, Silverstone Auctions is presenting a major sale at the Race Retro Show at Stoneleigh, uh, near Kenilworth in the Midlands. Uh, it's this Friday and Saturday, and uh, on the card are a phenomenal number of competition cars, classic cars, um, some automobilia to support them as well. And it's an absolutely essential part of your marketing strategy, isn't it, uh, Nick? Uh, Race Retro, it uh, fits in so beautifully in so many ways. Uh, good morning, Pat. You tell us about it. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Yeah, it's a great event. We're uh, proud to be a part of it. And uh, as you rightly say, nine years is the evidence of our uh, our support and, and belief in the event. You know, we we have to attract fantastic cars to our catalogue. That's the key to our success. And equally, we have to attract the buyers. And the combination of uh, the cars that we are able to pull in and the audience that Race Retro is able to pull in gives us a Tremendous platform. Absolutely. And uh, this year you've got some astonishing stuff. Uh, the Lotus uh, uh, 19, Monte Carlo, as it was known, chassis 953, uh, with a, a great list of, uh, of drivers on its CV uh, from Sterling Moss. And there's an interesting story about uh, that. Um, Graham Hill in his island, even Jim Clark uh, drove the car uh, during its frontline career. Yes, indeed. And Jim Clark won in it, would you believe? He did, yeah, as a, as a super sub for um, for its owners uh, some way down the line, but uh, really interesting. But the Lotus 19 Monte Carlo with the, the rear-mounted um, Coventry Climax engine was kind of the answer to Cooper's uh, Monaco, and uh, it was a car which uh, attracted a lot of interest, a lot of success uh, in the early part of the 1960s. But this car in the, uh, the iconic uh, pale green uh, UDT lace stall uh, colours um, is just uh, a, a marvellous um, icon of its era, Nick. It is. It's a real opportunity. The car hasn't been on the market for 60 years, which is quite a, a thing if you think about it. And uh, it's been extensively restored. I have to be honest, there wasn't a great deal left. If you read the history file, and it is a fascinating history file, it's five huge large Excel files worth of history and stories and results and invoices and what have you. But if you go back to the sort of roots of the car, um, it was damaged in an accident at Silverstone. A replacement chassis was, was ordered from Lotus. By the time that happened, of course, Tim Parnell, who you may recall, had uh, bought off Colin Chapman the, the drawings and the design work for the 19. So, in fact, the chassis that was made to replace the damaged chassis at Silverstone was a part of the Parnell era. And that itself was then raced and uh, unfortunately damaged in a fire back at the workshop. Um, and the damaged chassis from the fire is the part that eventually was um, found and sold and the restoration started some 10 years ago and it's taken 10 years to get it to the point where it's now a finished complete car. So, very varied and interesting story, but um, as you say, encapsulated in its time some of the best drivers of the day. Yeah, what, what I think is amazing, it, it, its story is not atypical of so many early 60s race cars because they were, um, they were crashed, they were, they were damaged, they blew up, etc. Uh, in, uh, in period, and uh, very, very few race cars can be deemed 100% uh, original, like probably a car that was taken to the track, broke in practice for the first time, and was was pushed away, never to be seen again. Was the only thing to uh, to come up in that uh, under that headline. But um, because we have such brilliant um, craftsmen, such fanatical enthusiasts, particularly in the sort of the grand marks that are, of which Lotus is is clearly among them, um, there is a a wonderful cottage industry within Britain and indeed elsewhere across the world, uh, which supports the restoration and the continued use of these cars. Uh, and this is essentially um, a, a, a new, uh, if you like, um, a, a new ready to race uh, evolution of that original, probably with, with one or two original parts in it. Uh, but that doesn't detract from its its value, its status, um, or its uh, 
um, kind of appeal to the, the wider marketplace. And I think uh, the fact that uh, we've got these world champion drivers in there, Graham Hill, Jim Clark, uh, on its um, on its CV, um, opens up uh, an interesting marketplace uh, across the world. And it is across the world that you're you're spreading your um, your, your reach, isn't it? It is absolutely globally. Yes, it's the old uh, only fools and horses thing with Trigger's broom, isn't it? You know, you had the same broom for very years, much, but uh, but he had uh, uh, six or seven different heads and six or seven different handles. Um, but yes, it is it is an evolution, as you rightly point out, of the original car, and it's the chassis plate and the identity and the papers that really uh, carry the whole uh, gamut of time. You know, the, the sixty year history of the car is those are the only continuous parts. Everything else over the years has gradually been changed or updated and uh, and that's not unusual in a, in a racing car that's very much part of known history very much not and i, and I think that uh, what is important you're going to have um something like 38 competition cars in the hall uh, at stonely on friday uh, 65 classic cars on saturday for that part of the sale uh, you don't have to be physically in the room or that that's where the excitement really lies uh in in being at a a, a sale or a, an auction put it that way through um but you can be um anywhere in the world uh bidding online through um through your silverstone auctions portals yes that's right i mean you've got lots of ways to bid you can uh, do your research before the auction you can even send a mark expert up to examine whatever lot it is you're interested in, have it verified and checked independently. And you can then put in a commission bid, for example, or you can bid on the telephone, or as you rightly say, you can get the atmosphere and bid in person. Or, of course, you can use the internet um, with our internet partner proxy bid. So you've got lots of different ways to bid, and you've got time to, to, to view the cars and, and independently have them checked and whatnot. So that's quite reassuring. Mm -hmm. Well, in contrast to that um, absolutely glorious pale green uh, Lotus Sports Racer uh, of the sort of 1960 to kind of mid 60s uh, era, um, one of the cars that's uh, also caught my eye on the catalogue uh, this year is Lot 212, which is the um, remarkable um, evocation um, of the Alfa Romeo uh, TZ2. Uh, it's a fully um, FIA HTP compliant uh, build of one of these extraordinary um, TZ2s. We remember the TZ1s, the, um, the little uh, tubular chassis uh, Alfa Romeo sports cars, but uh, the TZ2 is something that's so, so rarely seen these days. And I guess it's why um, craftsmen, original craftsmen in many cases, uh, were commissioned to produce this particular car, another car that has taken a very, very long time to build, using uh, references and measurements from two uh, originals. That's absolutely right. So not only is it uh, a replica or an evocation, as you rightly say, but it's actually a tool-room copy, this car, um, genuine tool-room copy. So every single thing has been uh, measured and uh, all shapes and sizes replicated totally faithful to the original. Um, and as you also rightly say, it's got FIA papers, so it can compete anywhere in the world, which is really important. And, uh, you know, it looks, I have to tell you in the flesh, as they did, absolutely stunning. I mean, it genuinely does. It, it looks a million dollars, and um, <laughs> we'll, we'll make... Um, uh, not <laughs> we'll make that, it. but uh, it would be nice <laughs> if it did, wouldn't it? But uh, yes. uh, at the end of the day... It's it's an opportunity for um, for Alfisti uh, to to use the term to actually buy into uh, a project of what is a priceless and, and and very very rarely seen car. I think I've seen two um, over my forty odd years of, um, of being really involved in historic motorsport, and um, there was one at Goodwood a bunch of years ago. But this is a car which gives the opportunity uh, to, to compete at events of that uh, stature. Well, the thing is, the two cars that you saw, as you rightly say, would be worth today about £3 million a piece. This exact yes. copy, which is indistinguishable from the real thing, is guided at two hundred and fifty to £300,000. So 
relatively speaking, ten percent of the of the cost of a real one is is value for money. Yeah, very much so. I think it's only my checkbook which separates me from it. I have to say, but yeah. uh, or maybe my wife's checkbook. But uh, no, it, it looks absolutely magnificent, and there is something special about this car, which has a lot of the styling cues from the um, the Ferrari GTOs of the period, and which make rather more than three million pounds <laughs> uh, uh, when they come up for a sale. Very, very rarely. Uh, it's an absolutely magnificent. Uh, piece of equipment and one that um, I reckon that uh, should prove very very popular. Um, elsewhere in the sale, you've got for um, for rally fans, you've got the last Subaru that um, that the late Colin McRae uh, drove. And um, I mean, you, you love your racing as and your rallying and competed in both. Uh, special car, very special car. Yeah, it's it's uh, the car that Petter Solberg used in the 2007 World Rally Championship, a genuine works pro drive built. Subaru, but significantly, as as you said there, the last car that, very sadly, Colin drove in public when he uh, demonstrated it at the 2007 uh, Goodwood Festival of Speed. So it's the last car that Colin was seen in, and uh, the car that Petter Solberg actually drove in that world championship. So interesting story and background, and very, very original, and it's lovely, iconic blue with yellow flashes down the side, looking, you know, as it did in the day. I, I saw one only on the road yesterday, a kind of a, um, a Colin McRae kind of tribute uh, Subaru and uh, amazing kind of offbeat, off kilter um, engine note that those uh, flat engines make. Um, just, uh, just amazing. Uh, and this is an opportunity to, again, to uh, have something, own something that was uh, uh, owned by an icon, uh, British rally champion, world rally champion. Um, Colin McRae. Uh, for rally fans also, there's a, a beautiful um, Audi Sport Quattro, one of the uh, one of the uh, the short Quattros, um, again put into uh, into rally trim and uh, something again that's uh, very special. Yeah, it is indeed. This is a replica car, just to be clear. Again, the real thing being worth about a million pounds in round numbers, if you could find one, at sort of eighty to ninety thousand as a guide. It, again, you're at ten percent of the cost of the real thing. But this recreation has been done uh, by a private individual to a very high standard over a good period of time. It's got the correct original engine, and original uh, uh, turbos and so forth, six-speed manual gearbox, but the sequential shifter, uh, you know, the proper eight-point roll cage, all the things to, and of course, sign written as inevitably it would be in those lovely yellow, white and black Colours of the works car with the HB, so a real eyepiece and six spotlights, you know, on the front. Um, if you go back further, there's a most stunning uh, Jaguar uh, XK120. Uh, there, a competition uh, car um, raced in the past by um, by uh, Duncan Hamilton, who went on indeed. to win Le Mans in 1951 and a Jaguar C-Type. Indeed, indeed, indeed. And this was this is a lovely car with real period history going back to 1950. Race history, of course, as you rightly say, with, with Duncan Hamilton, a, a, a very famous uh, driver of the day, sports car driver of the day, raced extensively by him in 51 and 52. Uh, it's done the Mille Miglia uh, since then, and it's done the Le Mans Legend Support Race as part of Jaguar's uh, uh, representation of the brand at, at, at the South. And it's got a lovely, lovely history car with pictures and uh, all sorts of things. Now, that's a more expensive car because it is of course an investment opportunity and it's guided four hundred to five hundred thousand pounds. But for, for somebody who is wedded to Jaguar and has the wherewithal to um indulge um the passion for the mark, this is um, absolutely indisputably the real thing. And uh and going back what seventy years pretty much the XK engine debuted back in nineteen forty eight. Uh, and these models, which begat the uh, the fabled C types, and then the D types, went on to win uh, Le Mans through the fifties. Just absolutely mighty. And the XK120 had a great uh, reputation as a as a rally car, a race car, and a road car. So it's uh, it really is a multi uh, multi option uh, uh, purchase if uh, that's how deep your pocket is. But you don't have to when you come to Silverstone auctions uh, and race retro. You don't have to nick. Um, push the boat out that far, and of course, the, the last thing you want to do is to be spending every cent of your uh, um, of your housekeeping 
um, on something you can't afford, but things that are kind of in the uh, in the sale, which are much more accessible for the average um, enthusiast, are, are things like the uh, the Ford Anglia Racer and the Morris Minor Racer, which uh, are, are are real uh, are real bargains and can get you that into that uh, competition experience for a fraction of the cost of uh, building maybe even a modern uh, race car. Absolutely correct, and and that's the key to a good auction. By the way, is to have that variety and that accessibility so that everybody can get involved, which is which is one of the reasons we have the the cheaper or less expensive competition cars, one that expression, and also the automobile and things like that. And if you if you look at the um, the Anglia, for example, I mean, Glenn Maskell, very well known, you know, ten years ago was out there in his super speed Anglias, winning everything. And one of the Maskell family's cars, Glenn's old car, has uh, resurfaced. The family has finally decided to let it go. It's a beautifully prepared, bright red Anglia. Looks just the part with papers and what have you. Fifteen to twenty thousand when you're at the wheel. Yeah, this is a this is a one hundred and five E Anglia, and I remember Glenn Maskell really well. Glenn and his sons used to campaign. A lovely, lovely guy. Sadly, taken too soon. And um, I remember seeing when he was um, when he was quite poorly in the latter stages of his life. Uh, the uh, the guys all went to spa, and it was like one of those absolutely heroic kind of um, boys' weekends away, uh, where they went and campaigned the Anglia um, and uh, just did everything you would have wanted to have done uh, with your dad and your and your lads doing it. Uh, absolutely marvellous, and uh, this is an opportunity to uh, to take to pick up with that car, um, Morris Minor uh, again. Um, a car which uh, you can use in all kinds of historic events, uh, both at home uh, and abroad. I saw one only in South Africa uh, competing um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's a Gonis uh, Triumph um, even before the days of the Mini. Yep. And I have to correct you here, Marcus, because this one actually is a Doris Minor. Yes, it's known as Doris. Um, it's uh, pink in, <laughs> pink in colour with a white roof, as you do. And uh, eligible, as you rightly say, for you know the HRDC Academy series and all of those good starter series. And again, a, you know, a very uh, achievable guide of fifteen to eighteen thousand pounds for Doris. Well, that's amazing. We're we're catching up. We're due to catch up with um, the HRDC uh, guys, Julius Thurgood and Co at Goodwood uh, next month. Uh, but uh, looking back, just um, before we close, uh, two sorts of auctions at uh, Race Retro. Uh, you've got Automobilia sales on both days don't you um before the competition cars which come up at 2 30 on friday um uh, from one o'clock on friday automobilia and i guess that means um all the usual super duper things photographs stickers programs uh all that kind of stuff that the motorsport enthusiast loves to hoard yes indeed and helmets and steering wheels and paintings and you name it we've got a bit of everything even motorsport orientated watches and then on the uh, the preview to the classic car sale on the Saturday, we've also got some automobilia lots uh, going through that are of more general nature. That sale starts at eleven o'clock on Saturday, and we've got uh, cherished registration numbers, we've got suitcases, we've got even an original 007 illuminated studio sign I'm looking at here as I'm talking to you. And yeah, I think sometimes, Nick, you um, you live the dream. Um, <laughs> immersed in motorsport and motoring from a very early age, and uh, um, still loving every second of it, um, you know, from from competing with your son Harry uh, in the um, Auto Trader uh, BMW M3, um, and uh, and presiding, if that's the term, over these um, great sales with uh, with your team, uh, attracting some of uh, the, the the finest cars onto uh, onto the market. The Silverstone auction sales uh, on Friday, the competition cars on Saturday, uh, the classic cars with. Their, uh, their relevant uh, automobilia sections as well. And um, really, it just remains for us to say uh, very, very good luck with it. We'll see you there, uh, certainly on Friday. And um, I hope that um, it uh, not only provides you with a, a great couple of days, but uh, uh, realises the dreams of uh, enthusiasts like me out there who uh, want to be involved and uh, want to maybe take the first step onto the uh, into the into competition uh, or collector's car ownership. It's uh, a great, great range of stuff you have on show. Thank you very much. We're really looking forward to it and hope to see everyone there. Thank you. 
This episode of the Marcus Pie Podcast on historicracingnews.com was brought to you by Silverstone Auctions. <laughs>